human being behind it, as messed up as they are, probably more. But yeah, they, they ought to know that. I'm, I'm going to tell you honestly, when I saw Bill Hamilton's segment interview with you, and you're, you're talking about your relationship with J-Rod and how you um, communicated with him telepathically, mm -hmm. um, that struck me as incredibly real. And from that point on, I was very interested in what you had to say. Because uh -huh. I said, this man, this man really experienced this. This is, mm -hmm. this is, not, uh, this is not bullshit. This, mm -hmm. is, the, this no. is the real thing. No. So um, if you could reiterate kind of how you started working with J-Rod. Well, uh, he was working with me before I ever knew it. Of course, he was on board, as I understand. I have no memory of him directly, but I mean, uh, as I understand, in 73. Uh, he had traveled to 73, and then, uh, this is even what I said to Jeff Ransom on, on the phone, you know, I said, my God, if this doesn't boggle, I mean, it boggles my mind that when you think about paradoxes to start with, um, that he traveled to 73, I was picked up, and then he subsequently traveled back to the 53 time frame and there was a crash which means that he was held at S4 in 1973 at the time that I was playing baseball with my grandpa and that he was also on board the craft impinging into our time lifting me up prosaically I mean it sounds crazy but you know it's a paradox I guess I mean but um, I, I actually came into direct contact with him at the uh, end of uh, 1993, start of 94. But yeah, there, there's something wrong with him. Um, during the entirety of my experience around him, he appeared, uh, the best that I can describe as off-shifted almost like, well, I mean, he was physical. I, I felt him through the glove. There was matter there with me, but almost like he was a ghost with a body. He didn't belong. He did not belong where he was. Um, yet, when he would communicate, when he would do the entrainment, um, they thump you, almost. It, it's almost acoustically. They thump you, and until they finally come into contact with the brain level waves where they can begin communicating, and it comes in waves. It's almost like the clicks of a dolphin. It comes in waves, and then you feel yourself pulled in, as the entrainment is occurring. That the perception is being pulled into his eyes. Um, very unwieldy feeling but then they entrain bringing bringing you down to relaxate you know relaxed almost to a theta state like an eight hertz type theta state where you're very almost like drowsy and they tell you you know they're not going to hurt you he did that he actually said that he would not harm me when he stepped forward on me when we were doing the, the old brides uh, dance as we nicknamed it where I would I was supposed to step forward to him almost like taking a bride step up the aisle and then he did the thing back to me, almost jokingly, but it was so unwieldy because he broke the protocol. It's like everything that had been established of trust at that moment, it went to hell. And uh, I got so afraid. There was a, a an animal response in me at that moment, a very, very human animalistic response of get me the hell out of here. And I stepped backward and fell backward onto my back. And that is really what I perceive myself as doing. I, I said to Jeff, I said, felt like I was a cockroach, you know, <laughs> lying on my back in there. And he walked up onto me. And I heard them yelling, fire the repress. They were going to into mess him. They were going to hurt him so that he wouldn't hurt me. And I was trying to yell no. And I'm not even sure to this day if I really yelled no or if it was just in my mind. The, the stress was that bad at the moment. Um, and he walked, literally walked up onto me and sat on my chest. He didn't knock me over. I mean, there was 
I think Ron or a couple other people said, oh, you know, he knocked you over in the, uh, in the clean space. He, he couldn't knock me over. He was too weak uh, to knock me over. He, he, even if he wasn't given his size, he couldn't have knocked me over. And how tall was he? Uh, just a little over three feet hunched down, uh-huh. almost four feet if he was to be extended out lengthwise, if he would be lying on his back and extended out lengthwise. But the malady, the, the, the uh, pathologies uh, under which he was suffering caused him to uh, have um, um, weakness, change of gait, change of stance, where most of the time he was extremely hunched over forward and he really couldn't stand up straight. When he would walk, he would wobble and kind of shuffle. He was so very so he got on your chest, he, he walked onto your chest, and, or sat on your chest. He was actually sitting on my, my um, abdomen area, but he was leaning forward with his hands onto my chest, was looking he, down. Uh, so he was communicating at that moment that he wasn't going to hurt you? Yes, he, he said, I, I, I won't hurt you, be any. He called me be any. And that goes to, it, it be any. He, he broke English up very strangely. Um, and you heard this in your head, I'm assuming. I'm assuming I heard it, it, in it, my it head. wasn't out loud. No, I heard it in my head, in my own introspective voice, but clearly not coming from me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the sound of yourself when you talk to yourself, self-talk? It, it's the same sound, except it's the wrong linguistics. It's the wrong wording. You could tell it's not you. And initially, when that happens, too, there is a, uh, uh, from my perspective, initially, when it was happening, there was a very panicky feeling. But, of course, that initially happened when I was part of the B unit team, when Stephen was still going in to the clean sphere. He looked at me through the clean sphere and spoke to me and said, I remember and hello. Meaning to he, me. the person who it was, uh, you call, what, what is his name again? The J Rod looked at you. Kayla. Kayla yeah. looked at you when you when Steve was in the clean sphere with yeah. him. He turned around and looked at you. Yeah, he turned around and looked at me. I was part of the B unit team to start with. In fact, that was going to be my actual occupation in there was assisting the chief scientist and in going into the clean sphere, until he identified me as somebody, I guess, special to him, Kayla, and he wanted me to be the person to go in there. That's why I was promoted ultimately to the working group leader in there because I didn't have the background, did not have the seniority, uh, and it was not my place. Um, but that's why the, the promotion happened. It was okay. one of those, so, well, to a go lot of back, promotions happen in the world, I think, but, <laughs> so, but to go back the to Peter where, principle. <laughs> um, he's, so he went onto your chest, he told you he wasn't going to hurt you, did they, did they actually zap him then, or did they? I don't believe so, because I would have felt... He, he began to entrain me immediately and strongly, and he relaxed me. The, the uh, encephalins, the endorphins were going big time. They, they, they entrain on several levels, and they're able to relax you by actually flooding you with natural opiates. Mm-hmm. Um, like a runner's high. Right. So what happened after that? You, I'm assuming or you got to... Or the high that you receive uh, as you're going through natural death process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you naturally kick yeah. out the, you know. Yeah. Um, but okay. So, but what happened after that? Uh, after that, I began to sink away from what was going on in the clean sphere, and with the panic that was going on over the radios, because I heard them. There, we had two separate units, an A unit and a B unit, on the radio. There were like separate uh, radio frequencies, and uh, I could push the button and talk independently. But they were stepping over each other, screaming, saying get a secondary unit ready to get me out of there. They were going to enter in to pull me out. And you can't just step in there that quickly. I mean, they've got to suit somebody up, bring them in. And you knew before you were going in there that the J-Rod, we were trained that they were a threat. And so that we were not supposed to communicate privately with them or anything like that, that we had a certain job to do and we were to get it done. And that was the scientific job of removing the the samples and then the studying of the samples for for the the back engineering. These are the the, um, uh, reversing like chemicals. The idea was to reverse uh, his 
an illness that that he and the, his people have which yeah, we were, is the 52 well, the 52s and and what we were trying to do initially jumping off onto the biology a little bit what we were trying to do is we were trying to actually strip the exterior cytoplasm off from the cells and and uh, produce cells which would be independently functioning then to understand those cells biochemically genetically so that those cells could then be re-added as a graft into the J-Rod to attempt to ameliorate the, the neuropathy. That's what one of the, 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 the stated goals was. <laughs> Easier said than done. But um, so, okay. we were told though that if something would go wrong in there, there would be no immediate fix. Um, you, you weren't a million miles away, but you were several thousand when you were inside there. So you were very alone, even though you had radio communication. It was essentially being uh, isolated on the space shuttle, if you will. And not that easily, you know, easy to get you home. Uh, because they had to do all of the repressurizations of the gantry, bring somebody new in, then get you out, then get you uh, detox, the, the, the cleansing, um, the decontamination, and then get you out of there then get you out of the suit, then give you medical treatment. So we're talking a couple hours. So if something goes wrong in there, and they're potentially able to harm you because of the, the entrainment, you're dead. And that's, you accepted before you ever uh, accepted going in there. And But to a large part, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't bravado on our part saying it's no big thing, but you had to accept that just to work inside the facility. Um, you knew that if there was a, um, a contamination, if the alarms started going off, the old joke was get a straight back chair and lean way over and kiss your goodbye. It was over. Because if the alarms started going off, you were sealed into the facility and they were going to pump the gas in and fire the fuel air device. Boom. That's what the that's what the explosive valves were for, the so-called escape tunnels. Uh, for you to get out in case there was an emergency, those were blow-off vents. Mm -hmm. So they could blow off and explode the facility, blow off out of the, the papoose range and keep the remainder of the facility intact. So, but your experience with the J Rod and the other ones you've met have has basically was it? Were you afraid for your life at any time? In other words, I was did afraid for my life when he stepped toward me. Absolutely, I was at that moment. At that moment, but it was a very transient. Um, you know, it was a very it was an ephemeral uh, moment. Okay. Um, How did you? It, it passed off very quickly because biochemistry helped me calm down when he trained me. How did you feel, though, in your sort of interactions with him? Um, in other words, do you feel that you said you didn't remember knowing him in the original meeting no. in the spaceship, right? Right. But he remembered, clearly. He remembered. So did you feel that the, your French, you actually developed a friendship with, oh, with this being? I absolutely did. And I that it grew did. over time, or did you feel that it was instantly there? That's a good question. 